Well, welcome everyone to the Sustainable Lifestyles Leaders Series. And today we have, it's my great pleasure, I'm Vanessa Timmer, the Executive Director of One Earth. Uh, and I've got the great pleasure of introducing Claire Neller, who's the head of RAP Asia Pacific, uh, which is connected to RAP UK. She's responsible for working and helping deliver the UN Sustainable Development Goal 12.3, which is about having global food loss and waste by 2030. And Claire is responsible for identifying opportunities, creating new linkages and partnerships, lasting partnerships uh, with uh, organizations in the countries, uh, governments, partners. And Claire also designed RAP's support programs with those partners and across RAP's functions and provides key account management and technical delivery for the campaigns that you're about to hear about. So what we'd love to hear from you, Claire, is just to start us off in a couple of sentences, what drew you to sustainable lifestyles? Uh, well, thank you for having me, first of all. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, in terms of sustainable lifestyles, I guess um, I kind of have always been what we would call a bit of a tree hugger. And everyone who works in food waste has like a little origin story, like how they came to be working in, in food loss and waste. And mine is that when I was younger, when I was a teenager, my grandparents used to run a B&B &B from their house. And I used to go and like help my, my granny. And one weekend we were kind of just clearing out the, the fridge, making sure everything was, was clean and everything. And I pulled like half a lemon from the door, you know, and you've like sliced a lemon and it's gone a little bit dry and you've just kind of left it in the door of the fridge. And I said, oh, I'll throw this away, shall I? And she said, no, 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 I'll find a use for that. And so kind of working in food loss and waste is, I guess, in my blood, in my genes. Um, and then that kind of stems across into the other spaces that I work in. So packaging, um, textiles and, and resource management as well. So, yeah, I think just, you know, my time being at RAP has really opened my eyes to what the art of the possible is and just how much how much there is that we can that we can do to, to help people live more sustainable lifestyles. Oh, that's great. So it's really come from all the way from your grandmother to you kind of passed down. And and when you experience that, when you when you heard her speak about um kind of using up this uh, this lemon from the door. Uh, how did that kind of take you on the journey from the beginning of your interest in sustainable living to where you are today? Can you maybe walk us through about how you channeled your interest into a career? You know, how did you start start and where did how did you get to where you landed? Sure. Now, um, I guess I I guess I took a, a kind of a non-conventional route to where I am now. So I I kind of, yeah, I've, I've always been interested in sustainability, but as, you know, as an individual, I never, I, you know, when I was at university, I never thought of doing it as a career. It kind of wasn't really a thing um, uh, very much then. I went into a whole bunch of other jobs. I essentially kind of ended up in sort of project and account management. Um, I worked in London for an IT consultancy. I went to work for the National Health Service in, in the UK. And I kind of accidentally ended up at RAP. Um, there are lots of people who, you know, who in their careers are like, I really want to go and work at RAP. You know, it's like one of the places to work if you want to be in sustainability. I was honestly not that person. Um, I was on a fixed term contract and I was looking for a for a new job and so I ended up at RAP on a, on a project management ticket and you know I've been there for almost 16 years now um, and I think I'm currently on my 10th job title um, within the organization so I've kind of bounced around I've done a lot of different things and I guess you know my because my um, kind of education did not kind of prepare me like I didn't do a vocational degree in sustainability I've really learned on the job and the thing that I think has kind of stood me in good stead is that I was just kind of willing to do a whole bunch of different things 
And like, like I said, I came in on a kind of procurement slash project management ticket. I've done big grant programs for infrastructure. I've run market development programs. I've set up a loan scheme. I started kind of doing wraps global work on food loss and waste. I've just kind of always been that person who's like, this seems like fun and a cool thing to do. Let's try it. And if it doesn't work, then, you know, it's not the end of the world. Um, and that's kind of how I ended up in Australia because uh, an opportunity came up um, with a project, a funded project here in Australia on food loss and waste. And, and off the back of that rap said, well, why don't we, why don't we make Asia Pacific our first um, overseas office and, yeah, it's just very on brand for me. I was just like, yeah, why why not? Like, what's the worst thing that can happen? Like, I could hate it and I could just come home and that's that would be fine. That's fascinating. And so, Claire, did you end up drawing on any of the other past jobs, like IT, National Health Service, that kind of thing in your positions in RAP? Um, in the sense that what, a lot of the things that I've done in RAP are either were either specifically a project management role or have involved a whole bunch of the skills that you learn when you're a project manager um so I, I guess that would be the main thing I think also having worked in both the public and private sectors it gives you a much more balanced view which working in RAP because we do sit in that gray space between public and private sector and, and the individual having that kind of ability to speak the lingo of both sides has been really beneficial um for me very very definitely and especially here at kind of in Australia doing the work that I do here across a whole range of different um kind of programs so like I said I don't just work on food here it's text it's clothing and and plastics as well um, so being able to kind of speak that lingo of public and private sector has been really valuable. Yeah, that's great. And actually, this is the next thing we wanted to hear about is about your about RAP itself and how your organization and your work on sustainable lifestyles. And, you know, maybe tell us a little bit about the food, clothing and plastics campaigns and Maybe within that, tell us about what's something exciting that you're working on right now that might not be already in its final phases, but might be in development. Sure. sure. Um, I mean, this is like such a luxury for me because I love, just love to talk about what RAP does. Um, so the potted history is RAP was set up by the UK government in 2000 with one very specific job to do, which was to increase the UK's recycling rate from the 12% that it was at the time uh, to something better than that. Um, and I think it's fair to say that everyone who was involved um, at the beginning of that thought that RAP would maybe be around for like two or three years, maybe five years tops. And kind of here we are 20 plus years later, kind of still, Doing, doing the work that needs to be done to create a resource efficient um, economy. And I guess thinking about it, it is quite interesting. So RAP generally doesn't often use the term sustainable lifestyles. Um, we talk about resource efficiency or a circular economy, but everything that we do is, is to help people live more sustainable lifestyles, whether that's when we talk directly to people or whether we make other kinds of changes. Um, and so I'll just I'll just spend a couple of minutes just talking about kind of how how RAP works, because we have we have similar mechanisms um, across the whole kind of suite of, of sectors that we work in. Um, so whether that's food, whether it's plastics, whether it's clothing. Um, and I guess that the way that I would describe it is that there are kind of three pillars that we, that we use to, to deliver the impact that we want to. So one of those is really around kind of policy and strategy and building the evidence base. So we do a lot of work with governments, whether they're national governments, whether they're regional or state governments, to really help both build the evidence base for policy and to create 
policy and strategy or advise on policy and strategy that then creates what we would call a supportive policy context for, for other interventions to happen. And so that spans a whole range of, of different things. So it could be research to really build that evidence base. Um, so RAP was really the first organization that ever published any research that said, mm, you know what, food waste is kind of a big deal and we should probably be doing something about it. Um, that was back in 2007, I want to say, maybe five. Um, and that was really the first time anyone had looked at how much food was being wasted from people's homes, how much food was being wasted across the whole supply chain, really kind of delving into the, the nuts and bolts of that. Um, and then it ranges right through to actually kind of working with governments to help write kind of strategies. So, for example, um, one of my favorite projects that I've done is working with the World Bank in Mexico to, to kind of help write the strategy for food loss and waste um, um, in that for, for the country, which just, you know, really was looked across a whole range of different stakeholders of different interventions and, and so on and so forth, which was just really exciting. So that's kind of the first pillar. The second pillar is where we really engage very deeply with businesses in a sector. So we call it, we call that mechanism a voluntary agreement. Other people call them public private partnerships, frameworks for action. There's a whole host of different names for them, but it's essentially bringing organizations together along a whole supply chain um, to look at how you might implement systemic change across that sector. Um, so for plastics, that's the Plastics Pact, um, which if you um, look at anything that comes out from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, you will see it's part of their kind of new plastics economy. And there are now Plastics Pacts all around the world, um, which are modeled off the, the version that RAP developed in the UK. And it's really about bringing together a whole sector. So that is uh, packaging manufacturers, it's um, packaging technologists and designers, it's the brands and the retailers, it's the local authorities who collect that material, and it's the reprocessors who are reprocessing that material. And it really looks at how do you make very big systemic changes across that whole sector to really shift the dial um, towards a more circular economy. And that's what it's very focused on. This is not just about recycling. It's about changing the way the whole system works. So are we reducing packaging where we don't need it? Are we looking at alternative materials? Are we, how are we incentivizing the inclusion of recycled content? All of those things. Um, we recently, just this month, published um, a really big piece of research um, it was somewhat overshadowed because a little skirmish had broken out on the same day as we launched the report, um, which was obviously you know, much more newsworthy. Um, but I do highly recommend um, just go on the RAP website and have a look at the, the research that we published um, this month on packaging and how we sell food with less packaging. Um, it's really groundbreaking and just delved into a whole host of different areas, looking at what the retailers were doing. It looks talks about date labels. It looks at how people buy and store and consume food at home. It's, it's a really a fantastic piece of work. So that's the kind of second pillar. And then the third pillar is where we talk directly to people about how they can make changes in their lifestyles to live more sustainably. Um, whether that's around food waste, so helping people to understand how, how much food they're wasting at home and what they can do about that, um, whether it's about encouraging people to take care of their clothes and keep them in use for longer, or whether it's about kind of um, how to recycle the plastic packaging and the other materials that they do have within their home. Um, and that really takes a very strong kind of behavioral science basis. Um, Everything that RAP does is evidence driven. We always want to be able to say, here's why we're recommending these things. Here's what the evidence says. Um, here's the latest behavioral science that talks about how you might use green nudges or social norming or some of these, you know, pretty scientific mechanisms to talk to people about human behavior and, and the way people engage with things like food, for example. 
um, which can be very emotive uh, issues and very tied up in kind of cultural norms and familial norms. Um, so it's a really interesting kind of intersection between um, you know, some, some pretty robust kind of academic and, and research literature and these much more kind of holistic um, and human um, kind of angles. So yeah, those are the kind of the three pillars um, that we work on. Something that I'm working on at the moment, which is really exciting for me is a product stewardship scheme for clothing here in Australia. Uh, so the federal government in Australia uh, put clothing on its um, priority materials list and awarded a grant to a consortium of which RAP uh, APAC is a member, it's led by the Australian Fashion Council. And essentially what we're here to do is figure out, okay, how do you bring the sector together in a product stewardship scheme to really shift the dial on how circular the clothing economy is in Australia? Um, it's really complex. Um, like many uh, Western countries, Australia manufactures about 4% of its own clothing. Everything else is imported. There's almost no infrastructure for even, even really collecting the that unwanted clothing, let alone recycling it. Um, there's a strong reuse sector, but still, you know, a lot of that material going into landfill and a lot of the material that is collected through the reuse sector being exported out of Australia um, as well. So, you know, some really kind of big, chunky challenges. Um, but at the, on the flip side, some really enthusiastic businesses. So even the businesses that you know, you might as a lay person think, oh, well, you know, Kmart's not going to be interested in that kind of thing. Um, it's a different Kmart to the American Kmart, um, but a similar kind of business model, you know, very affordable fashion. And, you know, they're one of the kind of leading proponents there on, they're kind of there at the table saying, yes, we can see that this is a really important thing to be doing, but we don't want to be the first mover, there's a there's a very kind of strong kind of tall poppy syndrome here in Australia. And so having a scheme that kind of brings those businesses together to allow them to all act in that kind of pre-competitive collaborative space um, is something that is really exciting. We're, we're still quite early stages. It's going to be about a year before that's kind of shovel ready. Um, but that's the thing that I'm working on right now that is really exciting for me. Oh, that's so great, Claire. And actually that example of the Australian Fashion Council work and the work you're doing on the product stewardship scheme now in Australia on textiles, it's interesting because it really, it sounds like it's combining those three pillars, the policy and strategy, the work with business, the people-oriented campaigns, you know, the evidence base behind it. And I know from speaking from Canada that we've also picked up the campaigns on love food, hate waste, and even inspired by love your clothes and have a plastics pack now in Canada. So, you know, I, I see how the work that RAP's done is not only help, helping in the UK, but is being picked up elsewhere. So is that, that's part of your way of working too, is th that's my experience of RAP as well. Um, do you want to just speak yeah. a little bit to that, about how it's being picked up globally, these approaches and the campaigns that you've worked on? Sure. I mean, RAP is, RAP has collaboration at its heart. That's, that's the cornerstone of everything that we do. Um, around, uh, you know, and RAP was set up in the UK by the UK government and had a very UK remit um, around kind of five or six years ago. We'd done maybe one or two kind of European funded projects, but nothing really that major. And um, I was kind of looking at the work that we did and I was thinking, I think there might be other countries that might be interested in some of these really cool projects. Um, that RAP has, has developed. And uh, so I kind of just, I was working in kind of business development at the time within RAP. And I kind of just was like, well, why don't I just go and see if it works? And it built up just really surprisingly quickly. So Richard Swanell and I were kind of doing it a little bit under the radar for a year or two. Um, and then our board said, oh my gosh, this is incredible. Like we're going to invest in your team, we're going to give you, we're going to designate some of our charitable reserves for you. We're going to give you a bunch of people like go, like do this more, do it better, do, you know, bigger and better, more countries. 
Um, and so Rap Global was was kind of born out of that um, out of that time, and we've really just gone from strength to strength since then, which speaks, I think, in part to two things. One is just the amazing work that Rap does, and the and the team, the the global team, and the rest of the of the Rap teams who just really are so committed. To, to delivering this work. And, you know, we've had people doing insane things like flying to Singapore for two days to give a presentation to a minister because he was like, this is the only time I can do. And I'm really interested in your work. And I, you know, and writing, then writing a, a plastic strategy for Singapore off the back of that. Um, but I think the other thing is, it really speaks to the partners that we work with in the countries that we work in. So RAP is not an organization that has a big global footprint. You know, the Asia Pacific office is our first um, office outside the UK. And it's, you know, it's just me right now. Like, we, you know, we'll have more staff, but we're not at that kind of big global footprint. Like, for example, WWF, not that there's anything wrong with that approach. It's just, that's just not our approach. And so the partners that we have worked with in the countries that we work in are just so, so important to the success of the projects and the programs that we do. Um, you know, building those relationships with those partners that, you know, some of them, the team in Mexico, I've worked with them for, you know, for five years now and just, they're my friends. Like they came to my birthday party. Um, you know, we just have such great relationships with them and they're the, they're the absolute cornerstone of the delivery that we do in, in the other countries that we work in. Yeah, that's so great. And I think so, I really see that as being such a strength of RAP is that relationship building and passing things on to other uh, country teams and this multi-sectoral approach to something that's historically been seen as more about people's education. So the fact that you take a policy, a business lens, and you bring people together in campaigns where you support people to live sustainable lifestyles, not just ask them to get more information about it, but, and sure. the results are clear that in a lot of the campaigns you've done with RAP, you're, there's real movement in terms of the actual amount of wasted food that's, that is, uh, that you, that doesn't happen because of the campaigns, the recycling around uh, textiles or the circular system around textiles, the plastics work, these are real impacts on the ground that are based in that evidence base, but also that kind of multi-sectoral approach where you're not trying to do it just with people's education. Um, that's part of it, but it's much bigger than that. It's a much more of a yeah. systems approach. I mean, it's, you know, the, the example that I always use when I'm talking to people about this is to say it's much easier to give people cheese in a resealable pack than it is to ask them to wrap up their cheese in cling wrap once they've opened it, right? So the changes that you make to the products that you sell, the packaging that they come in, the retail environment that you purchase them in are just as valid as the way, as when you talk directly to people. And it's not like, I would never say, oh, one is better than the other. You have to have both right? So you have to help people understand if they're going to buy new clothes, like what fabrics should they be looking for? Um, how do they find more durable clothing? But then at the same time, like they also need to understand how to take care of their clothes better, how to keep them in use, like what to do with them when they're, you know, at the end of, of the life that they have with that first consumer. So it's two sides of the same coin, not, not one or the other. And, and, you know, we've always taken that approach right from the beginning that you've got to help, you've got to change the context in which people are operating, right? If you go to the grocery store in the UK, you will very, very rarely find buy one, get one free offers anymore. You'll find half price instead. So same financial outturn for the consumer, different approach to how you sell people food. Um, so, you know, that, that's that's always the way that we've really thought about it is that they're two sides of the same coin, not uh, an either or. And then Claire, I think also the way that you work is so interesting. Um, I, what you're describing before that you're so keen to take on challenges 
you know, not afraid of failure, but also um, ready to try new things that are kind of on the cutting edge. And sometimes even starting them off the side of your desk because you have a hint or an instinct that it might be something that's worth pursuing, like bringing these campaigns to other countries. So in all of your experience in the previous work that you were doing and in these years at RAP, you know, what would be a piece of advice that you would have for uh, those who are just starting out or starting to be interested in involving themselves in sustainable lifestyles? Um, I think I would say two things. The first is perfect is the enemy of done. Like you are never going to have all of the data that you need. You're never going to have every single stakeholder on board. You're never going to have that perfect scope for the project. Just start. You know, it's so much easier to get people on board with a project that, you, that you've started where you can point to something and say, look, this is what we're doing. So, you know, just just kind of just start doing it and, and things will snowball from there. That has always been the approach that I've taken. And I think the second thing is just, as I said before, like, don't be afraid to fail because you will always learn something from that. You know, rap sets itself very, very ambitious targets. We know when we're setting them that we're not gonna we're not gonna deliver all of them. If we did, we wouldn't be pushing ourselves hard enough and we wouldn't be aiming high enough. You know, if we met every single one of its KPIs, that to me would be a failure because we hadn't been pushing hard enough and setting the bar high enough. So, you know, it's it's okay to to have five goals and achieve three of them because the two that you didn't achieve will have taught you way more than the three that you did about how to do that better next time, how to tweak what you were doing, how to talk to different people, how to scope it slightly differently, you know, that it will teach you so much more than the successes that you get. So yeah, then a little bit trite, but they're kind of, you know, they're, 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 they're like that for a reason that there's truth in, in both of those kind of aphorisms, I guess. Great. Thank you. This is Claire Neller, the head of RAP Asia Pacific. Thanks.